Let's see, are we recording? Awesome. Hello and welcome everyone to the course. This is my class on plastics where we'll essentially be going over the different types of polymer processing and essentially asking, how is plastic made? Uh, my name is Dr. Anna Marie Lachance. I'm a lecturer here at UMass Amherst in the Department of Chemical Engineering. I started here in fall 2022 and I teach courses on sustainable engineering, process dynamics and control, and polymer processing. I'm also a content creator. You can find me on many social media apps at that Anna Marie. And this is my cat, Coco. She's the worst. Um, if you ever need to get in touch with me, here's my info. But anyway, let's get the show on the road. So what better a place to start than the history of polymers? Starting with something you're probably familiar with, rubber. Uh, legend has it that in 1839, Charles Goodyear, as in Goodyear tires, Goodyear, accidentally dropped rubber and sulfur, sulfur, excuse me, sulfur on a hot countertop, after which it charred black but stayed fairly elastic, and voila, a whole industry was born. He didn't know it yet, but he had just invented vulcanization, the process of taking natural rubber and cross-linking it to make it stronger. We'll get into how cross-linking works a little bit later. Aside from rubber, some of the first commercial plastics were made of cellulose nitrate, a naturally derived compound that basically served to replace ceramics or ivory as material for making small decorative figurines. It wasn't until a few decades later that we started to use plastics in more robust applications with bakelite and phenol formaldehyde making up those old timey telephones and electronics. Later on, casein would become popular as um, Sorry, excuse me. Casein would be used in, um, hang on, something's missing here. Something I really think I need to add. This is the Connecticut River. The first thing I did when I moved to Massachusetts last summer was hike to the top of Mount Sugarloaf and stare out at its twists and bends. The river passes by my apartment, past UMass, and goes all the way down through Connecticut, where I was born, and into the Atlantic, meaning I could conceivably get myself a boat and sail from my current place of living to my former place of living and down to where my parents live. I think about that a lot, more than the average engineer probably does. I think about my connection to my home, about the Mohican and Pawgusset land I currently occupy, and how I can live my life in such a way that I can give back to the planet and minimize my harm to it. Most STEM courses don't start with a land acknowledgement, but this isn't like most STEM courses, if you couldn't already tell from the syllabus and this quirky delivery. This course is very much about land, and I hope it helps you ask bigger questions about land. The question, how is plastic made, is actually a ton of different questions wrapped into one. Plastic comes from land, after all, so we have to contend with who has access to that land, who gets to decide how it's used, what resources get extracted, and how are they processed, who gets to decide that the land is even considered a resource to be extracted from in the first place. The history of polymers doesn't start in the 20th century, it doesn't start in 1868 or even 1839, and it definitely didn't start with some random white businessman. It started millennia ago with the original indigenous people of what we now call America. The first known use of natural rubber was by the Mayan, Olmec, and Aztec peoples. If you know one thing about these cultures, it's probably the Mesoamerican ball game where players use their hips to pass a ball through a hoop. 
Those balls were made of rubber that they extracted from rubber trees in the same way that we might tap a maple tree for its sweet syrup for pancake and waffle based applications. They tapped other kinds of trees to extract rubber and latex. And it wasn't just for sporting events. They used it to make waterproof containers for carrying liquids. And by soaking textiles in the latex sap, they made waterproof clothing too. There's this racist notion that Native Americans were just hanging around, banging on sticks and stones until white colonizers showed up with advanced tools and guns and clothes and guns and even guns. But just to get this out of the way, here's a list of things indigenous people were able to invent just fine without white people's help. Wonderful. So why am I bringing this up? Well, because most courses on polymers don't bring it up. Their histories usually start in the 20th century with the discovery of the macromolecule in 1920 by Hermann Staudinger. In 2020, the American Chemical Society celebrated 100 years of macromolecular science with zero mention of the long, long use of natural rubber and plenty of other non-synthetic polymers. These histories are also presented optimistically, with technological innovation being the main or only focus, which leaves out a lot when it comes to the actual effects that polymers have had on the planet and its people. After Goodyear vulcanized rubber by accident in 1839, the material suddenly became useful to the industrialized world, and the rubber boom began. White businessmen from the global north became overnight millionaires by going to South America and Thailand to set up rubber plantations, enslaving the native people and tearing down acres and acres of forests. This slowed down a bit with the popularization of synthetic rubber in the mid 20th century, but these days natural and synthetic rubber are neck and neck and the industry remains incredibly exploitative. And rubber isn't even the only type of plastic that's wrapped up in exploitation. In this course, we're gonna be looking at everything from fast fashion and labor in the global south to PVC, polyvinyl chloride, and who has to handle those toxic chemicals. Our guide for the course will be Max LeBron's Pollution is Colonialism. This book lays out how plastic took over the world and what ideologies were at play in doing so. I'll also be giving you tons of other readings, videos from other creators, and even self-produced videos to help you understand not just how plastic is made, but what role plastics play in society. Welcome, learners, to Plastics in Society. Back to you, Anna. Thanks, Anna. It's about time I tell you what a polymer actually is. In the simplest of terms, a polymer is any large molecule or macromolecule made up of many repeating units of smaller molecules called monomers. Monomer, or mono, single, poly, many. Greek. Most of the molecules you've probably learned about in school are smaller, like water two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, or carbon dioxide, one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. Monomers are also smaller molecules, like ethylene here, two carbons, four hydrogens. But when this molecule undergoes a specific type of chemical reaction, many smaller molecules can combine into one long one to form a polymer chain. Sometimes these polymers are hundreds of thousands of monomer units long, with a number of monomers, N, in each chain being referred to as its molecular weight. The words polymer and plastic are usually used interchangeably, but it's kind of a squares versus rectangle situation. All plastics are polymers, but something being a polymer doesn't necessarily mean that it's a plastic, or at least we don't think of it like one. Technically speaking, wood is a polymer. It's made of thousands of repeating units of cellulose. But when we're talking about plastic, we're usually referring to something more synthetic, like bottles or plastic wrap or polystyrene foam, uh, things like that. Natural polymers like cellulose do exist, and later in this course, we're going to be talking about bio-based plastics. But for now, when you hear plastics, think more phone cases and cutlery than any, any macromolecule. Just a quick note on how polymers are visualized. All teachers have to contend with the problem of how to explain large molecules to an audience. Um, some use an analogies like wet spaghetti, which is long, thin, and wiggly, and can get tangled up in itself. Most simply draw stuff like these and expect you to get it. 
If you ever don't understand something fundamental about polymer science, please feel free to either ask me in either live discussion or via email. For now, I'll just point out that sometimes we might draw the same polymer in a number of different ways. For example, polyethylene might be drawn with or without its surrounding end groups. When written in the structural form, it'll usually have a little bracket with the letter N, where N denotes how many repeat units there are or its molecular weight. So if N equals 100,000, just imagine this chemical group right here in the brackets 100,000 times with the two CH3s at each end. We might also draw the monomer units with circles or dots um, as each monomer with a string connecting them, representing these strong molecular bonds that hold them together in one long chain. Polymers can also branch out in different directions as opposed to being linear, just one straight chain of monomers. Uh, and multiple chains can be connected together in a process called cross-linking. When a polymer is laid out in a linear chain, it has totally different properties than when it's either branched or cross-linked. And we'll talk about cross-linking in a little bit. Regardless of how the molecule is shaped, a polymeric material is usu usually has completely different properties than the other types of material that there are out there. Um, the relationships between a molecule's structure and its properties are referred to as its structure property relationships because scientists are very clever. Let's talk for a bit about polymer properties. Um, and by the way, if you want to dig even deeper into the physical science of polymers, I recommend taking a course in UMass's Polymer Science Department, uh, PSE 501, where they go over all of this in even greater detail. So why are plastics used? Well, one reason that plastics sort of took over the world is that they have really unique characteristics. They're lighter or less dense than wood or metals, meaning they can be used in all sorts of construction applications. They make good insulators, which is why thin plastic coatings cover most electrical wires. They can, some, some can stretch pretty far without breaking like elastic bands or even certain kinds of wraps or films, um, which makes them great for all sorts of things. Um, their elasticity. Uh, unlike a glass, they don't shatter if they're accidentally dropped or thrown across the room, um, which is helpful. Uh, it's easy enough to add pigments to a polymer to make it any color you like, like a clear bottle versus a green bottle or a blue one. And most importantly, it's cheap to produce, at least financially cheap. Never mind the environmental cost, but um, the price of synthetic polymers tracks closely with the price of oil since plastic is derived from oil. As long as oil is cheap, plastic is cheap to make. And conversely, as the price of oil skyrockets in certain you know, financial crises, plastic suddenly becomes hard to reproduce. And so we might have to switch to naturally derived polymers like with rubber. So let's go over some of the basic properties of polymers. And along the way, I'll discuss why polymers have those properties. What about polymer structures at the molecular level allows them to behave in the unique ways that they do, starting with molecular weight. Molecular weight, the Molecular weight, like I mentioned before, is the number of monomers in a polymer chain. This number can be in the thousands, the hundreds of thousands, or even millions. And much like if you have a really, really long strand of spaghetti, the spaghetti can get all tangled up and potentially be even unwieldy to stick your fork into and try and eat it. I personally cut up my pasta before digging in. Um, the longer your polymer is, the stronger it is, and the more its thermal properties are impacted. This is probably the single biggest determinant of polymer properties because the more entangled the chain becomes, the higher the density is, and the more its movement is inhibited by itself. If there are any experienced bakers in here, this is pretty much what happens when you develop gluten. The more you need a piece of dough, the more mechanical energy you're putting into the dough, the longer the gliadin and glutenin strands become, making your bread tougher and giving you a denser bread. The longer the macromolecule, the more dense your final product is. Incidentally, this is what makes gluten-free baking so tricky. Gluten-free flours, like almond flour, use starches as their structural basis instead of gluten, 
which is why gluten-free cookies tend to flatten out more and why gluten-free breads or brownies tend to crumble in your hands. You need something to bind together things and give your baked goods some structure. And gluten tends to be that thing, if not egg or some other protein. Just to really drive it home, here's a clear cut example of what happens as you increase the molecular weight of a molecule. Regular ethylene, the basic building block of polyethylene, a polymer, is only two carbon groups long. You can see the monomer right here, ignore the brackets. This molecule is a gas at room temperature. Compare that to butane, same basic structure, but four carbon atoms long, also a gas. Hexane though, uh, six atoms long is a liquid at room temperature. Still just carbons and hydrogens in a straight line, but now instead of a gas, it's a common chemical solvent. Octane, similarly, is a liquid, and it's used for certain kinds of engine fuels, hence high-octane racing. Cooking oils like vegetable oil or olive oil can be 10 to 20 atoms long, still liquid, but cooking greases, um, coconut oil, lard, bacon grease, are 20 or more atoms long and are thus solids at room temperature but nonetheless still easy to cut through with a spoon or a knife. Um, same thing for cooking greases, yes. But still easily. Um, and finally, getting into the thousands of atoms long, you have polymers like polyethylene, which are not only solid, but fairly sturdy and hard to break apart with your hands. In the same way that you have to heat up cooking grease in a pan to turn it liquid before using it to cook, Polymers need lots of heat so that they can be molded into their final shape, which is why polymer processing is even a field to begin with. Plastic needs to be heated to a very high temperature, usually hundreds of degrees Celsius, in order to shape it. And that's what polymer processing is all about. But here's another thing about polymers. Uh, the relationship between temperature and structure is really interesting. For most molecules, there is a clear-cut phase transition between temperatures. A block of ice will become a puddle of water if left above zero degrees Celsius. That same puddle will become a water vapor if it's put into a kettle and heated past 100 degrees Celsius. Literally every molecular mo molecule that's sufficiently small will work this way. Think of any given element or chemical and it has one melting point and one boiling point for any given pressure anyway. Polymers are completely different. Because their molecular movement is inhibited not just by the speed of the vibrations of individual atoms, but also by chain entanglement, there isn't just one point at which a solid polymer becomes a liquid. In fact, polymers don't ever become gaseous. And in some cases, it's hard to say they become liquid so much as molten. Instead, as a rock solid polymer heats up, there's a bit of a middle phase where the chains slowly start to untangle themselves and the polymer becomes rubbery. That's this phase transition right here as you increase the temperature. Then as you heat it up a little further, the polymer either becomes A, hot enough to flow and behaves, behaves a little bit more like a liquid, or B, decomposes entirely, becoming charred and burned. When characterizing a certain polymer, instead of saying it has a melting point, or a boiling point, um, like we do for a regular small molecule, um, we usually say that it has a glass transition temperature. There's really a range, but scientists sort of pick a midpoint in that range and call that the glass transition temperature, or Tg. The same is true in reverse for a polymer that's naturally rubbery at room temperature, like an elastic band or hair tie um, or a tire. If you froze a rubber band, or more accurately, brought its temperature down way past its glass transition temperature, it would be incredibly hard and brittle. I'll show you a video of frozen rubber in a sec, but first of all, when finding a video to show you, I googled frozen rubber and I found this image of a Disney's frozen themed rubber duck that looks like Olaf from Disney's Frozen ate a large duck. And if I have to see it, then so do you. Uh, anyway, here's a video of frozen rubber, real frozen rubber, um, that was frozen with liquid nitrogen. 
Um, hey, editing Anna, can you uh, splice in this video for me, please? <sighs> okay, fine, whatever. Thank you. The high molecular weight of polymers also affects its ability to be processed, to be shaped into its final form. If you need a physics-based refresher of viscosity, you can check out this video here. But basically, the more that molecules are interacting, the more resistant to flow it is, meaning we call that a higher viscosity. Polymer melts are not only viscous, but they're usually non-Newtonian in flow. If you've ever played with Ublek, cornstarch and water, you know what I'm talking about. Stick your hand in slowly and it flows fine, but hit it quick and it becomes rock solid. Most polymer melts behave in the same way, so even though polymers with higher molecular weights are stronger and have other great properties, they're really difficult to mold into the shape you want them to be in. This presents the greatest challenge in polymer processing. How do you have a plastic with desirable properties that is also easy to make. Higher molecular weight polymers have better properties, they're stronger and that sort of thing, but also have higher melt viscosity, which makes them harder to process. Broadly speaking, there are two solutions to this problem, which conveniently are associated with the two main types of plastic. This distinction is really important, so commit this to memory. The two types of polymers are thermoplastics and thermosets. Thermoplastics solve the processing problem by compromise. They say, okay, fine, we'll settle for a polymer that isn't as strong or as good of a conductor or whatever it needs to be so that it's easier to mass produce. These have molecular weights that are low enough to process, but high enough to get the properties you need. Thermosets, on the other hand, use a technique called cross-linking to get the very strongest, very best polymers without having to compromise. Remember before that I said you can connect two polymer chains, two branches of polymers together with chemical crosslinks? Instead of increasing the molecular weight so much that the molecular chains become entangled, you can use a lower molecular weight in general and then add a separate chemical that locks together the chains. Here's the thing though crosslinking is irreversible, meaning that thermoplastics can be melted down and reprocessed into new plastics, but anything that's been cross-linked can't be melted down again. If you try to heat it up, it'll probably just decompose instead of melting. It's also true that many chemical cross-linkers like formaldehyde are incredibly toxic, but we'll talk about toxicity another time. You can compare thermoplastics to thermosets right in this one example of a computer chip that accidentally got caught in a fire. The wire coating, which is made of PVC, a thermoplastic, uh, melted when it was exposed to high temperatures, whereas the actual chipboard, which is made of polycarbonate, is a thermoset. That means that it decomposed or charred when it was burned. To use another food example, imagine thermoplastics are like chocolate. If it melts, uh, you can reform it back into solid chocolate, but thermosets are like a cake. Once you make it into a cake, it's going to be in that form forever. There's no converting it back to cake batter after you stick it into the oven. And this is our first big sustainability issue. If we can't reversibly melt and reprocess a polymer, it's totally unrecyclable. What we should be able to do is take this bottle, break it up into pieces, remelt it, and make a new bottle. But that's impossible for any plastics that are thermosets. Um, thermosets make up 10% of plastics worldwide, meaning 10% of plastics are inherently impossible to recycle. I encourage you all to take some time and consider the plastics that surround you right now. Can you identify what they're made of? And if you can, is that a thermoplastic or is it a thermoset? How might you go about recycling your phone case or the chair you're sitting on or the carpet on your floor or your computer mouse. Plastic is everywhere, and yet stunningly, very little of it is actually recyclable. Distinctions like this are a big reason why I wanted to teach this course. 
most people are very unclear about which plastic items are recyclable and which aren't. Never mind knowing why a given item is or is not recyclable. Let's figure out a few other things that dictate whether or not a piece of plastic is recyclable or not by talking about some more structure property relationships. I have a good microphone at home, so I'm using that now. U using the good microphone for a change. <laughs> the next big thing to know about plastics is that they can vary widely in their chemical makeup. While polyethylene exclusively contains long chains of ethylene monomers strung in a row, other polymers have all sorts of other elements and chemical groups involved. These chemical groups change what properties the final polymer has, especially when it comes to its mechanical properties. Essentially, these groups affect how closely the polymer chains, the spaghetti, can pack together, which can make the polymer more amorphous, more wiggly, or more crystalline, more rigid. A good example of this is polystyrene, which has really large phenyl groups attached to its chain. If you're not familiar with chemical notation, each one of these hexagons is six carbon atoms with hydrogens attached. So with such huge groups being present um, all along the chain, it prevents the chain from bunching up against itself and becoming denser. This is why polystyrene has an incre incredibly low density, but is still solid enough to have a slight impact resistance, making it an ideal material for foam packing peanuts or foam food containers. You may have also heard this material called styrofoam, but styrofoam TM is the brand name for a specific Dow chemical formulation, like hand me a tissue versus hand me a Kleenex. There is no such thing, for example, as a styrofoam cup. That's just the power of the plastics industry's branding. When it comes to how polymers are structured, three things impact their mechanical properties, um, which go to affect their crystallinity or how rigid they are. The pendant group on the chain can be anything from a methyl group, which you can see attached right here, it can be double bonded carbons or other repeating monatomic groups like chlorine. It could be, yep, monotonic groups like chlorine. It could be, you know, large aromatic rings, like in the case of polystyrene, or other kinds of large chemical groups. Also, the actual chain can have variants, such as in the case of copolymers or polymers that have one or two rings mid-chain. So most of the polymers we've been talking about so far are fairly linear, but some can have a ring mid-chain, some can have multiple rings mid-chain. There's a lot of variants here. And finally, as mentioned before, polymers can be straightforward linear chains, or they can have a moderate amount of branching, or a higher amount of branching, or a high, really high amount of branching, and multiple leaps backward. All of these will affect not just the chemical properties of the final plastic, but its mechanical properties as well. I'll once again point out that this it's because of these unique structures that polymer melts have really unique properties. Polymers often behave in non-Newtonian ways, such as oobleck, like I mentioned before. Um, viscoelasticity, viscoelastic, is a phenomenon that describes how plastics can be both viscous, meaning they resist flow, and elastic, meaning they stretch when pulled but return to their original shape when you let go. You don't have to memorize all these terms, but the different non-Newtonian flows can be compared to food. Um, hope you're ho I hope you ate dinner before watching this. Um, ketchup is a pseudoplastic. Its viscosity decreases when it experiences mechanical stress, hence why it doesn't flow out of the bottle until you squeeze it. Or in the case of glass bottles, there's the old adage that if you smack the 57 on a Heinz ketchup bottle, the fluid ketchup will come out. Uh, Ublek is a uh, dilatant, that's cornstarch and water. Its viscosity increases when it's smacked, which is why you can run across it, but if you stand still, you'll sink. And this is more obscure, but mayonnaise is technically a Bingham plastic. When you dip into it with like a ridged knife, you can see the ridges take shape in the jar of mayonnaise. Um, a lot of condiment related content in this course. Hope, didn't, hope you expected that. Um, so the surface has ridges and peaks because Bingham plastics, Bingham plastics, mimic solids under low shear stresses, but spread easily when sheared, like mayonnaise, as you pour it on your toast or whatever. 
Polymer processing is an interesting challenge because polymers exhibit phenomena like the Meissenberg, the Weissenberg effect, where molten polymer can climb up a spinning rod just because the chains are becoming entangled, like spaghetti on a fork. Um, or extradite swell, which is where a fluid expands outward as it's pushed through a tube. Um, consider what happens normally when you, you know, you turn on your sink and water comes out, it kind of shrinks. But viscoelastic polymers sort of expand. Um, we'll talk more about this one next week when we discuss extrusion, one of the most common ways to make plastic. But this wide variety in chemical structure leads to another big problem in plastic recycling. Because there are so many types of plastic and so many ways for polymer chains to be arranged, it's really hard to deconstruct polymers back into monomers so they can be recycled into new materials. In a perfect world, we would only use one, maybe two polymers ever, maybe polyethylene and another one, um, and that would make it way easier to collect everyone's plastic and use chemistry to melt it down and deconstruct it back into regular ethylene and reforge it into either a new plastic or something entirely different like fuel or refrigerants. Because there's so many different types of plastic, oops, because there's so many different types of plastics, first of all, we have to overcome the challenge of collecting and sorting that plastic. And then we have to overcome the problem of breaking them down. Having polymers that form semi-crystalline regions like this prevents our ability to depolymerize them. Also, sometimes these chemical groups can be dangerous. We'll be breaking this example down later, but polyvinyl chloride has a chlorine group attached to it. This makes it like, extremely unsafe to manufacture, and it makes it so that if PVC catches on fire, it can react with moisture in the air to form hydrochloric acid, an extremely strong acid. Uh, not to freak you out or anything, but if you have a lot of polyvinyl chloride in your house, either in your pipes or if you have a lot of Funko Pops or vinyl records and your house catches on fire, breathing in the toxic fumes from the burning plastic would kill you faster than the flames would. Yikes. And you can imagine how difficult it is in recycling facilities, which, you know, melt things down at high temperatures. PVC isn't even collected as a plastic because the hydrochloric acid would cause unwanted side reactions that could ruin a whole bunch of plastic. So yeah, big problems. Um, let's talk more about how polymers are chemically modified and what impact that has on sustainability. For this class, I won't go too deep into the rheology and the viscoelasticity stuff, but again, you can take PSC 501 or material science course if you want to know more, or if you just ask me, I can give you my course materials for the more advanced version of this class that I teach to chemical engineering students, and you can learn all about viscoelasticity. So polymers can be pretty impressive from a material science perspective. They don't rust like metals do. They're super light, yada, yada, but they're not magic. Like any other material, they're prone to cracking, melting, defects in production, and all sorts of other issues. Here you can see like a cracked sink and that sort of thing. Polymers can even oxidize over time, and ultraviolet light can especially be harmful to plastics over a long period of time. Here is a UV-aged polymer rope versus a brand new one. And here's an example, again, of a faux ceramic plastic sink that's been extremely weathered. By the way, if you've ever wondered how people can say, this plastic bag will only degrade after a thousand years, um, we don't actually know that for certain. What most plastic products go through as part of their testing is UV testing, where they're put into these big chambers and exposed to high amounts of UV light um, for long periods of time. So if it takes, say, six, six months for a part to degrade under extreme UV conditions, we can use mathematical approximations to guess that it will take 150 years or so under normal environmental conditions. It's an educated guess, but it's still a guess. Plastic bags have not been around for 100 years. So for all we know, they might never fully degrade, or maybe they'll take... 500 years to decompose. Only time will tell. But um, these limitations of polymers are why we have additives. Additives are any chemical that's added to a polymer melt to either make it more processable or change how the final product works. A lot of additives are aesthetic, like adding pigment to a plastic cutlery to make it more colorful. Um, but many are, excuse me, 
Many are functional too. Prescription pill bottles are orange and they contain UV absorbers to prevent the pills inside from being exposed to sunlight and degrading. Additives can also make polymers more flame resistant, scratch resistant, bioresistant to prevent microbes and fungi from growing within them and making you sick and lots of other things. Additives are also added to polymers to make them easier to process, easier to make, like lubricants, which make plastics easier to remove from their molds, or plasticizers, which make them easier to shape. PVC, polyvinyl chloride, is actually a pretty useless polymer on its own. It requires the addition of tons of additives, plasticizers and lubricants and all sorts of things to be made into anything, to make it shapeable and made into anything. You'll get a much better idea of what this means when we start talking about specific processing methods like extrusion or compression molding. Um, but you know, we'll get we'll get there. And pro tip, you can always come back to this video at any time during the course. If you need a refresher, when I was in school, I would always go back to my old notes and old lectures and slide decks to refresh my memory on things and reinforce my understanding of something. And of course, my transcript and full slide deck will be on Canvas. So don't worry. Uh, speaking of reinforcement, <laughs> filters are really, or fillers are a really important addition too, because sometimes a polymer isn't strong enough on its own. For example, my cell phone case is actually made of 100% compostable. Well, it's 100% compostable, and it's made in part of plastic, but it also contains a small amount of wood pulp. You might see little bits of it in there in the camera feed. When you add a filler to a material to make it more structurally sound, this material is called a composite, containing the matrix, the polymer, and the filler, the strengthening agent. And if there's a lot of interest among you, I can discuss polymer composites and how they're recycled later in the semester as well. The point of adding these filler materials is to take on the mechanical stress of the material while staying relatively low cost. If you think of what steel rebar does in concrete, it's like that, but on a much smaller scale. Carbon fiber reinforced polymers are becoming particularly popular, especially in the automotive industry. We also have glass fibers, um, aramid, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene as its own filler to other polymers, and even ceramic whiskers. Um, for example, wind turbine blades are made of glass fibers or epoxy infused with glass fibers, and so are the hulls of many boats and sailing vessels these days. You can also add nanomaterials to polymers. My PhD research was actually in polymer nanocomposites, which have the benefit of making things stronger without seriously impacting their optical or electrical properties. Feel free to ask me more about this in live class. I work mostly with thin films, making better and more sustainable plastic wrap for food and things like that. Here's the problem though, uh, and it's a big one. Additives and fillers can make things completely unrecyclable in many cases. Think about it. Can you tell what kinds of additives are in the plastics you have? Um, if you have a recycling bin, and I really hope you do, take a look at what's inside. Can you tell with only your five senses, your sight, your touch, which have had lubricants added, plasticizers, anti-static additives? Probably not. There's also a lot of different types of plastic in there. Um, one bottle uh, can have the PET bottle, the polypropylene cap, and a polyethylene label. That's not even considering multi-layered materials that you can't separate by hand. Um, like I mentioned before, our current recycling infrastructure is unequipped for the sheer variety of plastics that are thrown in the bin. You can't just melt all of these things down into one block and reprocess it because it'll be an unusable phase separated gooey mess. A lot of polymers do not mix very well. It can't be remade that way. Just because something has this symbol, this symbol right here, does not mean you can just throw it in the recycling bin. I wouldn't fault you for thinking that, considering that this is what has been culturally understood as the recycling symbol. But when you see this symbol with a number in it um, on a plastic item, that's not a recycling symbol. It's a resin identification code. This right here is the recycling symbol created in 1970 by an artist. These down here are resin identification codes 
created in 1988 by the Society of the Plastics Industry. They do not tell you that something is recyclable. It simply tells you what the main polymer used is, while in theory, encouraging the end user to recycle it or reuse it somehow. In fact, PET, sometimes written as PETE or polyethylene terephthalate, and HTPE, high density polyethylene, are often the only two plastics accepted by recycling facilities, mainly because they're the cheapest plastics to recycle and usually contain the least amount of additives, though not always. This review was made um, by experts uh, in polymer upcycling research, including some people from UMass Polymer Science. It estimated the rough amounts of each main polymer resin, that's the type of polymer, that ends up getting recycled. PET, which is what plastic beverage bottles are made of, is only recycled 20% of the time. High-density polyethylene, which makes up grocery bags and the thicker bottles that contain harsher chemicals like bleach bottles, is recycled 10% of the time. PVC, which is very toxic to handle and contains loads of additives, um, is recycled about 0% of the time because it's generally not accepted by recycling plants and for good reason. These are dismal numbers, and there's clearly a gap in technology and infrastructure that needs to be resolved. This is why the best, most actionable advice I can give you about recycling is to look up what your local facility accepts. I can give you generic advice on recycling, like removing caps on water bottles, which separates the PET from the cap material, but your local facility will always be able to give you better advice. I encourage you to take a moment to look through this great website the, from the Springfield Materials Recycling Facility here in Massachusetts and figure out what you should do with a certain item. This kind of leads into our discussion of capitalist culture versus other ways of knowing and other ways of doing things. It's weird that you throw objects in a bin and they go away and you have no idea where they go. It's weird that you don't have a relationship with the people who collect your trash or the people who process your plastic objects into new materials. This will come up time and time again, but these objects came from somewhere. And after passing through your life for a short period of time, uh, they will go somewhere else. And so please be grateful for that and try to make sure that it ends up in the right place and not like the ocean or whatever. Okay, last topic for this first lecture. How are plastic products made and how are they disposed of? We'll be going over, we'll be going over this loop numerous times throughout the course, but here's a bird's eye view of how most everyday plastics get made, the full life cycle, if you will. First, material sourcing, aka fracking. 99% of plastics come from fossil fuels. Then crude oil is refined into a monomer, such as ethylene. Ethylene can then be modified into a different monomer, but no matter what, it's polymerized in a chemical reactor to get a polymer, usually in the form of uh, little pellets that can be sold and shipped to somewhere else for processing. Da, da, da. Um, the polymer is then processed using one of the many methods we'll cover in this course. Um, but usually melted down and then put into some kind of mold. Um, that plastic is then shipped off, used, and maintained over its lifetime that before being disposed of. Then depending on uh, the type of product, the type of polymer, some fraction might be recycled and reprocessed, thus closing the loop. Um, and don't forget that all of these steps also have energy use, water use, production waste, transportation and distribution, and other costs associated with them. We can generalize this and get an understanding of the life cycle of a plastic product from material sourcing all the way to end of life. But what options do we have for closing the material loop? In other words, what kinds of recycling are there? Because it's more than just taking this bottle, melting it down and making another bottle. That's actually just one type, and it's called primary recycling or closed loop recycling. A plastic product is becoming another product of equivalent value. So bottle to bottle. Compare that to secondary recycling, where plastic is converted into something of a lower value. For example, cheap futons and certain kinds of insulation are made with post-consumer carpet. So instead of carpet material being made into new carpet after it's thrown away, 
it becomes something of lower value and typically never increases in value again. Tertiary recycling attempts to reuse plastic as some sort of chemical feedstock. Methods like pyrolysis exist, which in, can turn plastic into fuel, although we'll talk about the environmental cost of that later in the semester. And finally, quaternary recycling is where plastic is simply burned to generate heat, which can be used to produce steam and electricity. Uh, according to the EPA, about 12% of the electricity that we gain by burning our trash, which is something that we do in this country, comes from burning plastic. Since they come from oil, uh, they're very energy-dense materials, but as we'll discuss, this also creates a lot of toxic gases, and that's not great. Also, chemical upcycling is a new and emerging field of science that tries to chemically deconstruct polymers into monomers, but as we discussed before, that's very challenging. Let me know if you want to hear more about that as we proceed with the course. To help visualize the four types of recycling on our little roadmap, we have primary recycling, which you know shreds plastic um, and then turns bottles into bottles or this something into the similar material or equal value material. Secondary recycling or downcycling, which gives things new life as a lower value product. Um, quaternary or burning for energy, which leaves the loop, but still produces energy. Tertiary recycling slash chemical upcycling, which repurposes plastics in new ways. And there we go. That is, in theory, how we can close the loop and all the different strategies that we currently have. But please recognize that lots of plastics aren't recycled at all. Um, the loop never gets closed. And most plastic items are destined for the landfill, the incinerator, or the environment. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation estimates that around 14% of all plastic is collected for recycling, and only a fraction of that actually ends up going back and closing the loop and becoming new material, closing the material loop. Um, the rest goes to incineration, landfill, or gets leaked out into our oceans, out in nature, out into the environment. This is our current paradigm, the system that the plastics industry has imagined for us. But there is another way. If we truly focus our efforts to addressing the problems well, we've going, we're going to be discussing this semester, we can create a new paradigm, one where polymers are fully deconstructable and recyclable. Uh, but this new world will only be made if we push the plastic industry and our political leaders hard. But maybe you're just curious to learn about how plastic gets made. That's fine. It's pretty cool, in my opinion, and this course will have plenty for you to chew on. We'll talk about extrusion, compression molding, injection molding, thermoforming, low molding, and tons of other really advanced processing methods. And it'll all be very cool. And you'll learn a lot for whatever future career you have planned, or maybe you're just curious. Along the way, we'll talk about all the science of how polymers work and what's informing the decision pro process for how plastics items get made. At the same time, we also can't ignore the bigger picture, plastic's role in the world of art, fashion, culture, policy, and climate change. This book uh, is going to carry us through. Um, the book that's going to carry us through that analysis is Max Liberon's Pollution is Colonialism. Ta-da! Uh, Max is an environmental researcher based out of Canada, and they're a leader in anti-colonial science studies and establishing what that looks like. Their book uses plastic pollution as a case study for how colonialism touches everything we do. And it's a great read for current and future scientists. So how are we going to run this course? Well, if you're a current STEM student, chances are you spend the vast majority of your time completing long, arduous homework assignments, uh, and very little of your time is spent doing actually sort of critical reading and thinking. Uh, things are going to work a little differently here in our course. Um, instead of super long homework sets with hours worth of derivations and calculations, your work will be front-loaded into the beginning of every week, and hopefully it all works out to be a similar amount of effort for you as your typical college course. Every week, I'm going to be signing you one of these longer self-produced lecture videos, as well as some other smaller videos and articles and book chapters from outside sources. Your job is to do these readings and log your thoughts in your course ebook, which is how most of your assignments for the semester will be submitted. 
Then, assuming we can make it work with everyone's schedules, we will come together for an open discussion and share our thoughts and questions for that week's readings. If we can't make a specific time in the middle of the week work, I'll figure out a way for us all to post to some discussion board on Canvas. Um, finally, I'll give you some reflection questions at the end of every week, which you will respond to in your ebooks by the end of the day on Friday. There will be no exams. I don't believe in exams. Woo, applause. Um, but there will be a semester long project for you to complete. And every other week there'll be one some, there will be some sort of deliverable for that as well. Basically, I want you all to pick one plastic object that you're passionate about um, and perform a life cycle assessment on it. So figure out how it's manufactured, how to recycle it, and how it could be produced in a more sustainable fashion. Uh, we can talk more in the live discussion about what an acceptable choice of product is, but my favorites from last semester included plastic bags, pipette tips, chewing gum, breast implants, glasses, hockey pucks, and Crocs, the shoe Crocs, um, one of my favorite ones. In the end, you can choose whether to submit this as a written paper or an oral presentation, so either a 15-minute presentation or a 10-page paper. Um, a full rubric for this project, project is available on Canvas in its own separate document from the syllabus, so please check that out. If you're watching this, hopefully you've already sent me a link to your course ebook. Um, again, this is how you'll be submitting your reading annotations and weekly homeworks. This is also how you're going to grade yourselves by the end of the semester. I'll also be leaving comments on your ebook as you go. So um, make sure you give me editing access to your ebooks. Uh, as long as you submit the pre course survey and send me a Google Drive link to your ebook and give me editing access, very important, we'll be all set. Um, if you're confused about how to submit your materials for this class, just shoot me an email or ask me during class. I know it's slightly different than uploading everything to Canvas or handing it in, but you'll figure it out. I believe in you. Um, so in this course, you get to pick your final grade. And by that, I mean, there's a rubric upon which you'll be assessing yourself. And as long as you check all those boxes, uh, you'll earn an A. Labor-based grading is a system where the more work you put in, the higher your grade ends up being. You can read more about it at this link here on the slide. But the short version is, I'm not trying to fail anyone. And I think as long as you try your hardest and work within the course deadlines, you should get an A. And even within the realm of deadlines, I'm also typically very flexible when it comes to deadlines. Your final homework for the week is going to be due Friday, but if you need to take until Saturday or Sunday, just shoot me an email. No problem. Take as many extensions as you need to to do your thing. I want you to give the best work and not a subpar work that is due on that that's on the due date. The deadlines are more guidelines to make sure the course happens as intended with a reasonable schedule. My hope is that the lack of points and stressing about deadlines or points is liberating for you and allows you to be more open and honest in your writing. There will be times in this course where there is a right answer, but I don't want you to be punished for getting it wrong. There will also be times in the course where there's no right answer, and I just want your honest, open thoughts. And I don't want you to freak out I don't want you to freak out and think, oh, I need to say the right thing or else I'm going to lose points or she's going to be mad at me and I'm going to lose points. Don't worry about it. If you're doing the work, you're going to get a good grade, period. So with that all out of the way, I think we can finally wrap up this first lecture. Next week, there will be another big video like this, plus the first half of the first chapter of Max LeBron's book. Um, for the rest of this week, be sure to finish um, the action items on Canvas, that being the pre-course survey stuff and finishing your course ebook for this week. You're mainly responding to this first video and the syllabus. Um, and yeah, I will see you all really soon. Hope to see you in live discussion and take care. Bye. Happy learning. Mm -hmm.